Good morning. Take a moment and welcome those next to you. Our order of service this morning is Divine Service Setting 4 on page 203. Our opening hymn is number 979, which is printed in the bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As I called an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The introit is printed in the bullet. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. 
And when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Old Testament reading for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them, and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not, remem he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Hebrews chapter 4. 
Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my wrath although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also, ent has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fail and may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked, and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Praise you, o Lord. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with, per with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We make confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seen, we sing him 602.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is the Old Testament reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Anyone who has a passing familiarity with the Star Trek franchise is well versed in the Vulcan greeting, live long and prosper. And as far as greetings go, you can't find one more universally acceptable than that. Who wouldn't want to live long and prosper? To live a long and successful life. That sounds pretty good. Of course, as is often the case, the trick is defining what we mean. And we can debate what constitutes a long life, but today God's word invites us to consider the last word of that famous greeting, prosper. How would we begin to define prosperity? What does the good life look like? That's the question that consumes King Solomon's attention in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. In this book, we have the observations of a man who was given access to almost unlimited wisdom, wealth, pleasure, and power. And he seems to have employed every last bit of it in search of the good life. He took for himself 700 wives and 300 concubines. He built houses and cities. He bought horses and chariots. He amassed staggering amounts of money. He imported exotic animals and goods from far off countries. Yes, Solomon was definitely an interesting man. And yet, when we come to the end of his life, the likely time when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, we find a man who seems to write with sadness and resignation. He begins his book by saying, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is chasing after the wind. And in the fifth chapter here, Solomon takes up the vanity of a way of life practiced by so many that you might think it's required by law to pursue prosperity by piling up wealth and possessions. We see this tendency show up in our lives in a variety of ways. Every year, Americans spend several billion dollars trying to make themselves better by hiding who they really are. Whether it's by playing the lottery or covering oneself with makeup and clothing of the highest quality. Millions of people waste resources And those who play the lottery, if they do make it big, their lives often become less happy. Countless families and individuals struggle under crushing debt because they've lived far beyond their means, trying to buy their way to happiness. And even those who enjoy financial stability often know the frustration of having homes filled to the brim with stuff. So much that we have to rent additional space to store the stuff that we're not using at the moment. And in the corporate world, stockholders are tempted to prioritize profit over all the other outcomes as the greatest good. Workers are often seen as expendable if layoffs will balance the books. In ways big and small, we discover by our own experience what Solomon experienced and observed almost 3,000 years ago. Those who love money 
will never be satisfied with money someone writes nor will he who loves wealth with his income this also is vanity for a person whose goal in life is simply to become rich when is enough truly enough and how much satisfaction can a ba bank account statement really bring if your life isn't tied to any higher purpose than making money for with an increase in wealth there is also an increase of those who want to share in that wealth in verse 11 Solomon writes when goods increase they increase who eat them and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes Yes, at first you might experience some pleasure that people are attracted to you, but you quickly begin to question their motives. Are they here for me or for what I can give them? Even children know this feeling when a friend comes over and is more interested in playing with their toys than with the people. We see this same dynamic in the halls of power with lobbyists and special interests passing favors back and forth. Even the leaders in the church face the regular temptation to treat the wealthier members with better than those who are less wealthy. Riches can be held to one's own harm. Solomon says, there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. That harm can come from the outside for those who desire to steal and defraud you. For with greater possessions comes the need to expend time, energy, and money protecting them. But even greater harm can come from the inside, from the twisted human heart, which is constantly looking for something, for anything, to provide us a good life apart from God. Today's gospel in Mark 10 flows out of the account of Jesus' interaction with the rich young man a man who was given the opportunity to follow Jesus, but who walked away sad, unwilling in that moment to part with his wealth. What a tragedy that was. And it's a tragedy, unfortunately, that many of us have seen in ways big and small. As the love of money turns people not only from trusting in God, but also from loving others well. Ecclesiastes tells us about the lover of money who is eating in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. And that conjures up the image of Scrooges we've interacted with, or maybe the Scrooge we've become at certain moments in our lives. Let's not forget that riches in which we trust can flee from us at any moment. Solomon recounts a sad story. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. Maybe you felt that same sinking feeling in your own stomach. You've lost a job or business failed and you can barely stand the thought of coming home and looking at your spouse or child in the face because you feel so powerless to provide for them. And there are countless examples of people whose wealth has been wiped out because of medical expenses 
and those stories foreshadow the reality that every single one of us will face one day that at the moment of our death or the moment of Christ's return, whichever comes first, our earthly possessions become worthless to us. As he came from his mother's womb, Solomon says, he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. With a sad winsomeness, Solomon speaks to us with the heart of a grandfather and makes a convincing case against chasing after wealth as the path to true prosperity. And his wisdom spoken in these verses rings out in concert with the rest of Ecclesiastes in exposing a deceptive lie. And that lie is that the prosperity and the good life are found in self-sufficiency, in independence. At some level, we're all tempted to believe that if we just gathered more, if we just worked harder or gained more knowledge or partied with the right people, that we can make our lives much better. But then in many subtle or magnificent ways, God crushes our illusion of independence and reminds us of just how small we are. He nudges us back into the groove of our vocations, our callings in the home, at work, at school, in our communities, all the things that Solomon calls the lot that God gives. And when that happens, that forces us to see how small that lot is in the grand scheme of things. We'd like to think that we have lots of control and that we can change the world or at least shape our own little world as we like. And then the world's maker comes along and says, not so fast. For the child of God, this need not be bad news. For God's not only calling us through these words to acknowledge our smallness, but also to know his greatness. He calls us to stop pursuing prosperity by paths of our own design and instead to trust that he has done everything to guarantee our prosperity today, tomorrow, and forever in giving us Jesus. And the news that Jesus Christ came into this world to bear our sins on the cross, to defeat Satan once and for all, that news alone has the power to give us joy in a way that a, a whole pile of dollar bills never could. Consider the account of Zacchaeus, a man who knew the emptiness of chasing prosperity through accumulating wealth, the ways that pursuit impoverished his relationship with God, and with his fellow man. His pockets are overflowing, but his heart is desperate until Jesus finds him. And what amazing grace that the God of Israel, the God of heaven, would journey to the insignificant little town of Jericho to find this one man up in a sycamore tree. In an act of undeserved love, Jesus calls Zacchaeus by name, like a shepherd calling his sheep. And that interaction with love incarnate changed Zacchaeus forever. His slavery to wealth was shattered by the liberating work of the gospel. And suddenly Zacchaeus found new joy in being an instrument of God's grace 
and using his money to bless the poor and to help reconcile relationships that he had damaged. And that same gospel rings forth for you and me today. Jesus calls you by name. As surely as you were washed in the water of baptism to find prosperity sola gratia in his grace alone. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by you his poverty might become rich. When we look to Jesus, we see the richest expression of love demonstrated in the extreme poverty of death on a cross. And then we sinners, rich in things and poor in soul, can know the true prosperity in belonging to him. Taste the richness of that love. Today, as we partake of his true body and blood in the sacrament of the altar, and rejoice, rejoice in the treasure of forgiveness and eternal life in him. Rejoice in the daily blessings of food and drink and work. And rejoice in the opportunities God gives you to bless others with the wealth he has entrusted to your management. In Jesus, we discover what it really looks like to prosper. Even better, in Christ, we discover a God who is committed to giving us true prosperity for his glory and for our great joy. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the gathering of the offering. Remember the family of Doris Schmidt, who was called into eternal life this past Thursday and will be given Christian burial this Tuesday at 2 p.m. Visitation is from 4 to 8 uh, on Monday evening. We rise for prayer. O 
O Lord God, you are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the giver of life. We thank you for all the mercies you granted to our sister Doris during her earthly life, especially for calling her to faith in Jesus Christ. Comfort the survivors who mourn her death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a rightful reunion in heaven. Keep us mindful that we are mortal so that we will ever be prepared to die in the faith and receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And almighty, everlasting God, for our many sins we justly deserve eternal condemnation. In your mercy, you sent your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who won for us forgiveness of sins and everlasting salvation. Grant us a true confession that dead to sin we may be raised up by your life-giving absolution. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may be ever watchful and live truly and godly lives in your service. And, o Lord, our God in holy baptism, you've called us to be Christians and granted us the remission of sins. Make us ready to receive the most holy body and blood of Jesus Christ for the sake of of our lives and for the forgiveness of our sins and grant us grateful hearts that we may give thanks to you O father now and forever and almighty god heavenly father we your unworthy servants give you humble and hearty thanks for all the goodness and loving kindness that you have bestowed on us we praise you for your creation preservation and all the blessings of this life but above all, we bless you for your boundless love and the redemption of the world by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Behold in mercy all those in authority over us. Supply them with your blessing, that they may be inclined to your will and walk according to your commandments. We humbly ask for your abiding presence in every situation that you would make known your ways among us. Preserve those who travel, satisfy the wants of your creatures, and help those who call upon you in any need, that they may have patience in the midst of suffering, and according to your will be released from their afflictions. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and everlasting God for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death, and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, 
and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the, to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 922.
couple of things. Uh, I will be gone soon after the service as possible to the pastors district pastors conference in Osage Beach uh, until Tuesday afternoon. Uh, if you're wondering, that's why Doris's funeral is at two o'clock. Gives me time to get back. Uh, also today there is an open house at Thrivent. Starting at 11, going to 2, they've got food, drinks, dessert, and celebration to support the local food bank. Uh, everyone is invited to go and have a good time. Also, we have our quarterly voters meeting immediately after the service today. If you are a voter, please stay. It shouldn't take too long if we get a quorum to, to get the business done and get done out of here. Have a blessed week. Hope to see everyone back next week.